The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Good evening and welcome to Bronx Talk. There was talk that tonight's guest wanted to run for the soon-to-be-open congressional seat in the 15th district that is being vacated by Representative Jose Serrano. However, in a recent op-ed piece in the Gotham Gazette, Senator Gustavo Rivera turned down the potential opportunity. We will talk with him tonight about why. We will also review the prospects for the New York Health Act, which did not get passed in the last legislative session, and we'll also address many of the initiatives that did get passed by the state legislature in what was an historically active session. Please join me in welcoming back to Bronx Talk, the senator from the 33rd Senatorial District, which includes, and he knows them, the Bronx neighborhoods, University Heights, Kingsbridge Heights, Kingsbridge, Fordham, Van Ness, Tremont, East Tremont, parts of Marsani and Parkchester, a very big district. Senator Gustavo Rivera, hi, nice to have you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so let's talk about that. Um, uh, you know, everybody's talking about it. Everybody wants to run for this seat. It's an open seat. It's, it's an important seat in, um, uh, in, in Congress. Uh, and yet, uh, Gustavo Rivera, a veteran politician in the Bronx, said, eh, not for me. How come? Well, I, I actually have to think about it long and hard. It is a district that I think is incredibly, it is incredibly important that we pick the right person for that district. And when you look at the demographics of the district and the work that I've done over the last couple of years, it certainly fit the type of thing that, uh, you know, it, it, I had to think about it really long and hard. But ultimately, the question came down to me, why do I do this? Why am I in public service? And for me, it's ultimately about having access to power so I can determine policy for the communities that I care about and change their lives for the better. And the reality is that the place where I can best serve my constituency right now is in the New York State Senate and in our newfound majority. Let's just uh, look at that race. I mean, uh, Richie Torres uh, has, has already thrown his hat in the ring. Mm -hmm. Michael Blake has thrown his hat in the ring. There's talk of others, Marlene Cintron and others who might want to run. Obviously, uh, Reverend Diaz, uh, Council Member Diaz, uh, is also uh, running. Do you get the sense that maybe um, uh, more progressive Democrats are going to cancel each other out and uh, pave the way for uh, Senator Diaz to radically change the nature of that seat? Well, I think the most important thing that we have to dem that we have to know, if if we care about progressive Democratic values, we have to make sure that uh, that Reverend Diaz does not see that congressional seat. Uh, the idea of that of that person who we have already seen uh, be a mess both in the Senate and in the Council, uh, bringing those types of values that he that he defends so much to the Congress, uh, to the detriment of the people of the Bronx and of uh, of our of our national political standing and, uh, as Democrats, uh, we need to be looking long and hard. And I think that over the next couple of months, what I expect to do is work along with those individuals who are currently candidates and and really ask ourselves really tough questions like I did. I mean, uh, whether I, I had a sense that maybe I could actually take a lot of the support and be able to, to coalesce it, uh, but the reality is that my best place is to be in the Senate. However, I want to make sure that I continue to be involved in this race because it is important that we make sure that the Diaz is not in that seat. And in this particular moment in history, whether we're talking about what's happening nationally, what's happening in Puerto Rico, what's happening right here in the Bronx, uh, we need to make sure that the right person is in that seat. Diaz is not it, uh, but, the, but the person who I believe is the best candidate I will eventually endorse. I have not found that person yet, but hopefully working along with those folks who care deeply about the Bronx and the future of our people, we, we pick the right candidate and it, back that person. Is there a numbers reality that says if three 
more progressive candidates run, they split that vote, and then Senator Diaz, who is popular, excuse me, count, he used to be a senator, mm -hmm. Council Member Diaz, um, then ends up winning because uh, you know, he gets a majority of a, a very small pile. That's a possibility, and we can't allow that to happen. We can't have somebody who is anti-choice, anti-marriage equality, who cares more about dancing in front of the camera with his cowboy hat as opposed to actually thinking deeply about the issues that impact our country and our community. We can't allow that person to be there. So I'm going to make sure that uh, I do everything I can, working along with people who care, again, deeply about the Bronx, deeply about our country and where we are in our country. We cannot move in the direction that he would want to move us. Uh, what are your thoughts on the uh, progressive movement in uh, Congress? Was, of course, it, it bleeds out to the <coughs> Democratic states and the Democratic Party, uh, where um, obviously uh, Donald Trump is a target uh, for Democrats, and, and they certainly are eyeing the uh, presidential election. But uh, there's warring between Democrats. You are a, a pro progressive Democrat. I don't think you would deny that. Uh, I, would have, actually, I would actually even call myself liberal which is what some of my colleagues run away from like crazy. <laughs> and, and in <clears throat> fact, I avoided the word uh, in this conversation already. <laughs> um, but um, uh, uh, what's your vision of it? I mean, um, liberal uh, Democrats like <clears throat> Elliot Engel, uh, Gerald Nad Nadler, Yvette Clark, they're being targeted, whereas traditionally you would say these were the people who have been the most progressive, the most liberal in uh, Congress. What, what are your thoughts about the warring between Nancy Pelosi and people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez? The question, we are, let, let's make no mistake about it, we are in a crucial moment in the history of our country. And I think anybody that really lifts their head up from their immediate, from what's happening right now, and just looks not only at what's happening locally, but what's happening across the nation and internationally, we are in a, lo we are in a historical moment in our country. And so for our party, the Democratic Party at the national level, the question has to be who is going to be our standard bearer, what are the things that we're going to stand for. And the reality is that the status quo has not served the people that are most vulnerable, has not served women well, has not served the LGBT community well, has not served immigrants well, has you, not served you, the poor and the dispossessed. let's be specific. Do you think Elliot Engel, Gerald Nadler, and Yvette Clark have not done that? I wouldn't say that necessarily. But I think that the, the, the larger question, ultimately, each one of those is going to have to go to their constituencies and make the case, like I do every single year. Every two years, I come mm -hmm. to my constituency and I say, this is what I've, these are what my values are, these are what my principles, this is the policy that I've pursued, these are the things that I've done in office, and I'm asking for two more years in the Senate. So that's what they're going to have to do with their constituency. And the, the fact that, the, but the problem, the thing is right now, where we are nationally, we are in a, in a moment in history where we can't just do the get along to go along to get along. We require incredibly immediate action on climate change, on, cr on, on immigration, on criminal justice. We can't just be like, well, we'll, we'll kind of see kind of what's going to happen. We can't have that kind of go along to get along. So I, I am glad that these challenges are happening because the right questions can be asked. It doesn't necessarily mean that the incumbents will not be able to answer them and to be able to say, this is my record, this is what I've done, and this is what I'm going to do going forward. But the challenge is those questions have to be there. We cannot, the status quo has not served folks well, and we need to move in a different direction. In our uh, very diverse uh, borough of the Bronx, uh, immigrant-filled immigrant uh, borough of the Bronx, the notion of go back where you came from would be grounds for dismissal. I don't think, I, I, I don't know that I have heard that and having grown up and lived here my entire lifetime. I don't think I've ever heard anybody really say that, yet it came out of the mouth of the presidents of the United States. Um, what do your Republican colleagues in the Senate say about, maybe you were out of session at that time, yeah. but things like that? <coughs> uh, uh, you know, I, think and, that, I mean, well, do you hear talk about it? Do they defend the president? Well, we're, the last days of session, obviously, were in June, so we're already a month removed, and like this uh, administration, just every single day, just keeps <laughs> redefining new terrible and horrible things happen every week. Uh, but I would say that uh, I would ask anybody, Democrat, Republican, or whatever they call themselves, conservative, liberal, maybe they're not attached to a party, but they need to ask themselves a real question, which is, do you still support this person who is in this office? It has been clear to many of us for years that he is complete racist, he is a bigot, who has a white supremacist organization in the, uh, in the White House, who enriches himself and his family and his friends. That's all that he cares about. He is a narcissist 
who is going to, who is moving towards a fascist state. This is the reality. So you have to ask yourself, are you still going to, to be supportive of that, regardless of what your party is? And this is the question that I pose to my colleagues now because I have not been in the Senate for the last, you know, I have not been in session, I have not seen them directly, but I question them all the time. And I just tell them, this is the person that you, that you support. Is this really what you stand for? And some of them, to their credit, have taken kind of a step back. But at this moment... Although not very vocally, frankly. That is precisely we, we, what I'm saying. At this moment... We don't see that... It uh, has not vocal. been that vocal, but it needs to be vocal for anybody who considers themselves an American and who strives to make this country what it's supposed to be, then we need to move away from what this administration and the abomination of the White House is doing every day. Uh, credit for uh, the Democrat that's taken the House uh, was given to the Democrats' uh, support for health reform and health care reform and uh, what um, uh, the President and uh, Republicans had proposed. Uh, you are now the chair of the Senate Health Committee. Uh, we, uh, as I mentioned at the top of the show, we did not get uh, health care or the <coughs> New York Health Act approved. Um, why don't you start from the, the, the bottom? What is the New York Health Act? What might it do for uh, everybody in, in the state of New York? But of course, we're concerned about the borough of the Bronx. And um, why didn't it get passed? And what, what's the trick? What's the solution to getting it passed so that we have even more health reform in the state of New York? A few things here. First of all, this was an incredibly successful year across the board, not only in the Senate as a whole, but certainly in the Health Committee that I've been very honored to lead, thanks to my leader, Andrew Stewart Cousins, who appointed me as chair. <clears throat> and even though we were not able to get the New York Health Act done, which I will get to in a second, whether it was moving forward on Maternal Mortality Review Board, which actually is to make sure that we can identify the reasons why black women die after birth, uh, after giving birth at a higher rate than other, than other folks. We want to make sure that we identify that and stop it whether it's making sure that we protect the rights of adults in health care facilities, in adult health care facilities, whether we are, are lev uh, lowering the elevated threshold for lead, uh, which is all these things we managed to get done through my health committee, so I'm very, very glad that we got able to do that. But the New York Health Act was not one that we got able to do this year. What is it in a nutshell? The New York Health Act seeks to create a single-payer system in the state of New York. What it would do is it would create one health care system so that regardless of your age, of your gender, of your income, of your immigration status, you would have access to the same health care system. It would be paid for with a series of taxes that are actually, uh, that are actually uh, progressively uh, organized, so basically the people who can afford more would pay more, and we would take Medicare and Medicaid money, and everything would go into one pot to pay for it. It would actually be cheaper, it would actually provide higher quality health care, and we can get into why, but that is something that Ultimately, I want to make sure that health care is seen as what I believe it is, which is a right, not something that you should be able to, if you can afford it, you should be healthy. No, you should be healthy just because you're a human being. Uh, various analyses that I have read and uh, oppositions uh, that has come out about it has said, and, and I'm, <laughs> you know what I'm about to say, that it's too expensive, that there's no mm -hmm. way we don't want to pay more taxes. New York State is the highest tax state in the nation, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, you're never going to make the monies work because... Uh, the amount of money it costs to even get one operation, even a simple appendectomy from somebody for somebody, is uh, the, the, the costs are outrageous. Um, how do we afford it? Well, first of all, the system that we have right now is incredibly expensive and it does not give us good results. So what we have right now is a system that is led by a market mentality, which means that ultimately decisions are being made about your health care onto whether something can be afforded or not. Insurance companies are making decisions about your health care. Insurance companies that might not know anything about health care. Mm. They might not be doctors, but they're making decisions about whether you get access to something or not. So what we want to do is to take that out of the picture. Now, how can we afford it? <coughs> and pardon me. Number one, we risk share, which means insurance, insurance works when you take everybody and you put it into one pool, right? All the resources, you put it into one pool, and then some people need an ounce of water, some people need a gallon of water, but because we all share the risk, we actually can, act, can, can spread it across the entire state of New York, 20 million people, the entire population. Number two, providing everybody primary care means that people will not have to go to the emergency room to get care, which is the most expensive care. Third, make sure that we get administrative costs down. When you have in, in private insurance companies, between 15 and 18 cents of every dollar are spent on administrative costs, how about we go up to three to six cents? Finally, right, getting drugs to actually get drug manufacturers to negotiate with the entire state so that we can say, would you like to sell us 
drugs for 20 million people, maybe we can strike a deal. All of these things together, every analysis tells us we will actually save money and provide better care. I'm going to give you a, a real <coughs> example of uh, something Excuse that we, um, uh, I think we each go through all the time uh, in terms of uh, how we deal with uh, doctors in healthcare. You go see a doctor, maybe you have a, a procedure of some sort, and then you get a bill, and the bill has 15 different items in it. One of the items, I'll just use a number, is $1,200 for something. You say, wait a minute, that is no way. You know, if you stuck a needle in my arm and they charge me $1,200. But then the whole thing is kind of, I don't know, for want of a bit, gerrymandered, so that, well, that part was discounted, this part the insurance company pays, and all of a sudden you have a $90 bill. All of those dollar figures figure somewhere. Either that's what they've charged the insurance company, so ultimately that's what you end up paying. And the whole system is, it just doesn't seem to make any sense. Correct. Uh, uh, presumably, this is what you're addressing. If you cut out all that kind of phony math, mm -hmm. you'll be able to save money on the front end for consumers. Yeah, ironically enough, what we want to do is we actually want to simplify the system, which uh, I have to tell a you, as a, <laughs> as a consumer, that would be nice. Right. And so <laughs> we want to simplify the system. The, the attacks that come at this, I mean, Let's, let's just step back for a second. We are the only modern democracy that does not have a version of single payer system. The idea that you can be sick and if you can't afford to get care, that you should maybe die, or even if you are insured, because check this out, if you're uninsured, you have access to emergency care, et cetera. If you are insured, you still have access to that emergency care, but you have somebody making decisions about your health care, or even you making decisions about your health care, about whether you can afford it or not. If you have four kids, and all of a sudden everyone is sick in the house, and you're going to go to a doctor's office, then you have four, four people that you have to pay for, you have four co-pays, and then you have what is the network and out-of-network charges, and all this. What we want to do is simplify that. And again, it is an incredibly complicated process, both politically and technically, but if you believe that health care is a right, and if you believe that the current system does not currently and correctly address the healthcare concerns of our people, the New York Health Act is the way to do it in the state of New York. Would the New York Health Act fortify the state of New York and uh, residents against uh, challenges that may, uh, legal challenges are one thing, that may come from federal overhauls of Obamacare and, and other uh, health infrastructure? Well, certainly. I mean, there is, there you know, is. You can, you can basically, I'm going to use a very bad term, build a wall, build a health wall. Let's not use that term. <laughs> Let's not around, use that term. Around the state of New York and say, well, this is how <coughs> we handle it. You guys can do what you want to no, do. This, first of all, I do not use that. I'm not going to use that term. What I will say is that. It just occurred to me. I believe, for, also to take a step back, I believe that the best way to do this would be to do a national system. Um, the, to do a national system like what is being sought by some, by some presidential candidates like Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren, excuse me, is the best way to move forward. But because we're not seeing enough progress at the national level, I believe it is our obligation as New Yorkers to do it. And the thing is this, we have a state that because of our population makeup, because of our, of our tax base, we can actually afford this. And every study, 95% of people will pay less in healthcare than what they're paying right now. That's what we're talking about. There, there's an, uh, this will be the last healthcare question. We have a lot uh, we still want to get to. Yeah. Um, people in the family, I'll use myself and my wife, we are on different plans for different reasons. We're of different ages. And so I see some doctors, some are approved by my plan. She sees some doctors, and every time one of us has to go to see maybe a specialist, maybe not, thank God, we're healthy, not, not even for something very serious, all of a sudden there's a whole chain of, do you cover this? Do you accept this plan? Can the New York Health Act wipe that clean so that at least there's some sanity and you're not lost in an administrative battle just to get seen for a simple eye appointment? The short answer is yes, because ultimately what we want to do is to create one network. When you have, as you said, you and your wife have different plans, therefore the plan that you have has one network that is negotiated. Insurance companies negotiate with provider, the providers and create a network with their rates and all, everything, everything else. Your wife's plan does the same thing for whatever pool they're covering. What we want to do is do away with that network, do away with that network, create one network. So we make sure that regardless of where you're from, regardless of what your wealth is, you will have access to a doctor. 
because ultimately everyone will be in the same network and will be paid by the state. Basically what the state will do, because we're not going to be managing health care, what we're going to be doing is paying the bills. That's ultimately what we're starting to say. Uh, by June 2020, uh, you will come back here and we'll be able to say it got done, or you're not sure? Well, what I'm going to what I'm going to what I'm going to continue to do, we're going to do a series of public hearings. We did one which lasted 13 hours, Gary, 13 uh. hours, and it was an incredible experience to be able to see people coming from all over the state. This was up in Albany to talk about what this means for them and what it would mean for their families and for their communities. So we're going to do a series of public hearings. We're going to do three more across the state that will be announced shortly because we want to make sure that we get input from all over the state and I'm going to make sure that we take my colleagues I'm actually organizing a trip to Canada to talk to some of the providers over there and talk about how the system works in Canada uh, and we're going to be building momentum from here until next year can it pass well ultimately I have to make the case to my colleagues in the same way that I'm making it to you that I'm making it to the people that are watching right now and to people all across the state of why this is the way to go and my goal is certainly to move it forward we're gonna see whether I can be successful uh, I, I, I'm just going to throw this out because I really do want to move on. I, I guess there's a natural suspicion about the state of New York undertaking another bureaucracy. <laughs> so uh, well, listen, good luck I, as well. Listen, and I, and, I under, and I understand that reticence, but we just have to start with the question, do you think that it's, do you think it's, a, that, that it's a right, and do you think that the current system works well for you and your family? Uh, among the entire list, and I've got a page list of legislative um, uh, solutions, so to speak, uh, that were passed in the uh, legislature uh, this this uh, past session. I brought a uh, list, too, because the, there were so uh, many of them well, that I've what, forgotten what, them before. What's at the top of your list? I mean, I'm thinking that the housing bill was um, pretty much up there for you and your district. You, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, I have about 67,000 units of rent-stabilized un of rent stabilized apartments in my district, as I said many times, including the one that I live in. And a couple of years ago, I could have said I had 70,000, but we lost 3,000 the time that it took us to renew the, the rent, the, the housing bills, the housing law. Uh, the, what we did was unprecedented. It was not only permanent, uh, which means we're not going to have to come back and do this fight in a couple of years. We actually reformed a lot of the system because what we want to do is we want to de, uh, de incentivize the people that had looked at housing as some sort of speculative investment. See, when you have families that have been here for generations that own 10, 15 buildings, and they're looking at having a normal income you know, increase over the years, what we've seen is that those families that are still doing that, those are the good landlords that we want. Unfortunately, the system that existed before we did this bill created a system where people just got into the business to see if they could identify three or four buildings to then flip them in a couple of years to be able to make to something make back. It was, a, do we want to disincentivize the people that are looking to do that? And we're trying to incentivize the people that are, that are good landlords, which there's many of them, who are going to, to, they're going to make some money every year because that's the way it works in the system. And owning property obviously makes your wealth go bigger. But the system that existed before, we want to disincentivize that, and I believe that we've done that. Uh, do, I, what I've heard from uh, people in the real estate industry, they say, you know what, maybe we'd be less likely to invest in our properties if, uh, if, if you know, as this uh, develops. Maybe it'll um, um, make us uh, less likely to invest in the borough of the Bronx because we can't make uh, the amount of money that it'll take to build housing, refurbish housing, et cetera. I do, I do not believe that. And I think that what we did <coughs> was to take the concerns from people that brought these concerns in good faith because many landlords and people in the real estate industry brought, inter in, brought forward their concerns and in good faith we took them into account and I believe that we crafted a bill that balances out the interest of landlords that do, do definitely need some income to be able to pay for, for advances to, for, for improving their properties but also took into account that ultimately to have a speculative investment to have a piece of housing, a piece of property, which is a place where people live, a place that people need to be able to not be out on the street, and to create and to have that be a speculative investment, it inc it increased the ability of people that are bad actors to do all sorts of stuff. And trust me, you go to my office and you and you hear some of the horror stories that we've heard about from the bad landlords. We want to disincentivize those. We want to incentivize or create a system where the folks that are that, that are talking to you in good faith about their concerns. Can continue to make a living and make a profit, but not make a crazy profit. 
that's ultimately what we want to make sure that we do. On the backs of tenants, I see. Correct. Uh, early voting was passed, and uh, it was hailed as, wow, look at this. Uh, you know, we've got a, a, a new opportunity to encourage people to vote. And then it, was, uh, it came out that, wait a minute, we don't really have enough polling sites or polling sites that are conveniently located. <coughs> Is that a concern for you? Well, yes, we like early voting, but where? We certainly, listen, first of all, to take a step back, uh, this year, and the reason why I brought the list is just because of that, just like the list you have in front of you, <laughs> there is so much stuff that we, we got go. done this year, which is completely, this was an unprecedented year, whether it was the voting reforms that we get to pass, and, we, and we're talking back, we're going to talk about that in a second, the Reproductive Health Act, gun reform, getting the Child Victims Act done to protect kids, to protect adults who were abused at kids, uh, uh, election reform, the agenda, we banned conversion therapy, uh, we, we got bail reform done, which was done by Senator Bailey right here in the Bronx. We got the green light license for all that got over the finish line with Senator Sepulveda, sexual harassment uh, reforms that were achieved by Senator Biagi. The Bronx team is doing it. The Bronx team is doing it strong. Now, as far as voting reform, you are right. There are some things that we're going to need more resources to be able to provide spaces so that people can vote. Uh, but this is something that needs to happen. What, we're try what we did at the beginning of this year was say to ourselves, we, for a very long time, have been dealing with a democracy that unfortunately is not as open as it needs to be. We need to make sure that people can register to vote earlier, that they can vote earlier, that they can do, that they can vote if they can't be Take on election day. Take another 15 seconds because I got one more thing before we run out of time. We definitely need more resources to make sure that we get it done right, but we will do it because expanding democracy is a good thing, and that's what we did with these reforms. As a uh, local uh, state senator, let's see, you got a senior health fair coming up, uh, which <coughs> I see here on Glad uh, Friday, July 26th. Glad that you asked. Back and I have to the school list right giveaways. Here. That's right. I'm looking at the whole thing here. And I'm glad that I'm glad that you brought it up because my, my communications director would have would have. Well, that would be the last time she'd allow you to come on our exactly. program. Exactly. <laughs> Very quickly, for those folks who are watching, we've got the sixth annual senior fair. That's July 26th from 12 to 2 at Monroe College. Please call my office about that on Thursday, August 1st, Thursday, August 15th, and Thursday, August 22nd. So three weeks in a row, we're going to be doing backpack giveaways, back-to-school events all across the district. We've got a cultural immigration event coming to the Bronx Zoo uh, August 19th. All of this, if you go to my, if, if you go, if you see me on Facebook, if you go to uh, my, my Twitter account, if you go, if you go to I think BronxNet will also have them on their oh, yeah, you, calendar you have a, pages. Like, you could probably have it right underneath yeah, so here. You're take care you of put all, the, all of that Put this stuff. thing right here, huh? Right. That, Senator, huh? Um, um, well, we'll, <laughs> we'll certainly have you back may, maybe before the end of uh, the next session yes. uh, to find out how the Health Act is doing and all the other things you're working on. Looking forward to our conversation then. Thank you for being straightforward with us tonight. <laughs> and folks, if you have further questions or comments on anything you heard on tonight's show or anything going on in the Bronx, Email them to us at bronxtalk at bronxnet.org. You can send us a tweet at Bronx Talk or post them on our Facebook page. We'll forward and get you answers. Uh, if you ask us, we'll help you get to the senator as well. We thank our producer, Helen Greenberg, the directors are William Guzman and Nick Marrero, the cast of thousands, and to you, we'll see you next week. Good night.